check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels with just a quick message to our viewers to check out our main YouTube channel, Sea Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, where we have all of our over 610 videos posted. By going there, you can see all of our videos organized by playlist, categorized by subjects. Once you scroll down past our Bible prophecy trailer at the top of the channel page, the playlist begin. You'll see our recent uploads playlist, followed by our most popular videos playlist, followed by our playlist on Jehovah's Witnesses, then Islam, the Muslim religion, then Roman Catholicism, Darwin's metaphysical evolution religion, Seventh-day Adventism, dealing with anti-Trinitarians and early church history, our multiple playlists, which includes God-hating atheists, phony TV preachers and King James onlyists, dealing with UFOs, ghosts, spiritual warfare, our radio shows with national Christian authors and our music bids, the Black Muslims, Louis Farrakhan, and the Nation of Islam, Mormonism, Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, Antichrist, Cults, New Age, and World Religions. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, and Spanish videos. End times, supernatural prophecies, and tough Bible questions. And our playlist dealing with predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism. Our YouTube channel is built to help people learn the Bible and defend their Christian faith against false prophets that come against it from every side. Jude verses 3 and 4. At the time of this recording, our channel has already been blessed with over 6 million viewings and over 10,000 subscribers. And now for our main video presentation. Our ministry has two newsletters available on the subject of Seventh-day Adventism, and they are free to anyone that sends an email with your mailing address to our ministry email address, cdebater at aol.com. The first newsletter is by former SDA member for 44 years, Wallace Slattery, who wrote the book, Our Seventh-day Adventists, False Prophets. While the second newsletter is by Dale Ratzliff, a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist and a former SDA pastor for 13 years. Dale has written several books on the SDA, including one called Cultic Doctrine. You can also see all our newsletters online by going to our website, www.biblequery.org. Our ministry has also produced multiple video series with each of these gentlemen, which can be seen on our YouTube channel, Sea Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television. Look for our playlist there called Dealing with Seventh-day Adventists and their prophetess, which has over 20 videos. Well, how are you saints this morning? Well, I'm glad you recognized your saints. That's good. <clears throat> well, I count it a privilege to be able to study with you this section from the book of Philippians, because it was a, a very insightful a section of Scripture to us. Now, I say us, Carolyn and I. A little background, um, Carolyn was my fourth grade girlfriend. She was my sweetheart in high school. She was my fiancé in college, and we've been married uh, 
coming up 59 years. So <clears throat> we've had quite a journey together. But part of our journey, we were multi-generational Seventh-day Adventists. And I pastored in the Seventh-day Adventist church for 13 years. And this section of Scripture was one that really had insight for us as we were transitioning out of that denomination. We discovered that a lot of material about saving righteousness. We discovered the what, the why, the where, the how, and the when of saving righteousness. And sometimes I think those of us or you who grew up in a Bible-believing church, you just take the gospel for granted. And you don't understand the magnitude of the good news that is within it. But if you grew up in legalism like we did, wow, the gospel is super good news. It's good news like a pitcher of cold water to a couple of tired and thirsty and hungry hay haulers. Bill and I had just purchased a Freightliner truck. We were on our way home to Napa, California. We had loaded hay in Lovelock, Nevada. This was our first time over this road, and it was Bill's first time at driving. I had driven truck quite a bit before, but he was the driver today. And as we were going up over the high Sierras, we noticed that our differentials were heating up. We had gauges on the dashboard. So we thought, well, we better stop and see what's going on. And sure enough, they were very hot. And foolishly, we took our water jugs for drinking water and poured them out on the differentials to try to cool them down. Well, not used to the top-heavy load that hay is, Bill rapidly drove up a slanted section up to the road, and a third of the bales fell off the trailer. So here we were. We had already been up about 20 hours. We had no loader. All we had was hay hooks. Does anybody know what hay hooks look like? Okay. That's how we used to load in those days. And uh, so what were we going to do? So we figured out we could stair-step them back up to the bed of the trailer, but how are you going to get the last bale on from the ground up to 13, six, uh, 13 feet 6 inches high? So we, what we had to do was stack them up. You know, you, you look there. We went up three or four bales higher than in the picture on the front of the trailer so we could lower them back down and, and go on. So we were absolutely exhausted. And we were almost delirious for lack of water. So we drove for quite some time until we found a coffee shop. We ran in, sat down, and said, Water! The, the uh, waitress brought two glasses of water, and we just immediately drained it right down. She brought, brought a pitcher, and we drained that as well. It's the same way with the gospel, the good news of salvation. When you realize you are tired of trying to be good enough, and you're ready to give up, when you realize you're dying of a spiritual dehydration and when your spiritual energy gauge says something's wrong down inside, then if you drink deeply of God's grace, you realize how good, how refreshing, how nourishing the gospel is and it will bring peace and joy and rest. Real peace, real joy and lasting rest. It is a life-changing experience. Yes, the gospel is good news for open sinners and legalists. And according to the gospel, legalists are the worst kind of sinners because they don't sense their real need. But if we feel our need for righteousness, as Bill and I that day felt our need for water, we have this promise. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they finish it shall be satisfied. Well, with that introduction, let's pray and read the portion of Scripture for today. Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to preach the good news, to share what you have given in this very wonderful passage of Scripture. Lord, help us to understand the surpassing value of knowing Christ as our Lord. Thank you. 
Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else had a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to the zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. Uh, verse 1 now, finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. I'm not going to say much about this verse because Pastor Mike, in uh, a few Sundays ago, talked about how the Philippian church was founded with joy and rejoicing when Paul and Silas were in prison and, and suffering, and they were singing hymns to God. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I had this in my notes to talk about how we should rejoice even in suffering. And then I hurt my back. And I said, now, am I going to rejoice because I hurt my back? I thought, no, I don't think so. I think I'll rejoice in the Lord even though I hurt my back. Okay. So that's all I'm going to give that verse. But now I want to go to verse 2 and on. And there's a big section of this particular part of Philippians where Paul deals with false teachers. And in his day, it's what we call the Judaizers. And he's going to say, beware, beware, beware. And his admonition and warning are just as relevant today for us here in Camp Verde as it was for the Philippian church way back in Philippi. Well, wh who are the Judaizers, okay? They're probably defined best in Acts 15, 5, where it says, um, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed, they were believers, okay, stood up was saying, It is necessary, and that's the operative word, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. In other words, for the Judaizers, faith in Christ was not sufficient. To faith in Christ, one must add all the laws and statutes and judgments that were in the law of Moses. And Paul says, beware. First, beware of the dogs. Now, what does that mean? Carolyn and I go for a walk almost every morning, and we go by a house that have three large dogs. They have a, a um, St. Bernard, they have a Great Dane, and they have a Mastiff. <laughs> and when we go by, you can hear that woof, 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 those big, big dogs, you know, and that says, beware of the dogs. They don't even have a sign up, I think. It's just automatic. But that's not what Paul had in mind. While there were little dogs that were family pets that would eat the crumbs from the children's table, most dogs were wild scavengers that would run the streets looking for a, a free lunch they could grab, uh, maybe a tasty leg of lamb off your barbecue grill or something like that. 
And it was the same way with the Judaizers. They would wait until Paul and his, uh, his uh, associates had built up a gospel church. And then they would go in behind them and try to win their allegiance and steal their members. And I would like to paraphrase or rephrase what Paul says, beware of the dogs to this. Beware of proselytizers. Now, what is a proselytizer? A proselytizer, uh, they're groups of people who are searching to get members from other churches, believing members, okay? They're not trying to, you know, win them to Christ. They're going into churches that where they already believe in Christ, they're stealing their members. That's what proselytizers are. And we're going to look at some examples. And Paul says, beware, beware, beware. Beware when two nicely dressed young men in white shirts knock on your door, and you may see a couple of bicycles parked out by the road. Now, Mormons are typically very nice, clean, and good people, but they have a false gospel. To faith in Christ, they add their temple work of baptizing for the dead. They believe that if they follow the teachings of Mormonism, they will actually become gods. They believe that Christ and Satan are spirit brothers, and they teach that the Bible is not the complete word of God, to which one must add the writings of Joseph Smith. Beware. Beware when you see a car parked on your block with several people going door to door, handing out the latest edition of Watchtower, telling you that Christ is not God, the Holy Spirit is not a personality, and telling you that if you believe in the Trinity, you're really worshiping a pagan Babylonian God. They believe that Christ is a created being inferior to the Father, and they will insist that Christ died on a torture stake and not a cross. Why that? Because they will say, well, a cross is a symbol of paganism. Beware. And the next one I know about. Beware when you receive in the mail a highly colored graphic advertising a prophecy seminar that will explain the mark of the beast in the United States in prophecy. It will probably have the pictures of beasts portrayed from the book of Daniel. Seldom will the fire tell you that this is actually an evangelism program by the Seventh-day Adventist Church designed to convince you that unless you worship on Saturday Sabbath, you will get the mark of the beast. And if you start down the road of their indoctrination, they will tell you, and listen now over the next couple of sentences. Most of the people don't even know this, okay? If you start down the road of their indoctrination, they will tell you to be ready for Christ to come, you must demonstrate perfect obedience to the law because there will soon come a time when in your human state, before the second coming of Christ, you must live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator because Christ has left his position in the sanctuary above. Try that for assurance. Now, beware. Okay, all of these groups are out to capture you and convince you that unless you join their group, you will not be saved. Yes, beware of those who proselytize believing Christians. Next, Paul says, beware of evil workers who want to put you under the bondage of works. And he's still talking about the Judaizers. And today there's a movement that is very, very similar to what the Judaizers were actually teaching, teaching called the Hebrew Roots Movement, who teach that only if you're going to be saved, you must keep Saturday Sabbath, and you also must keep the new moon celebrations and the annual feasts commanded in the book of, of the law of Moses. Beware. Others teach that unless you interpret Scripture through the writings of their prophet, you will be deceived by your own Bible study. And if you study with these groups, you will find that they use a text here and a text there to 
you know, teach their jaded teaching. They will not study with you in a contextual way. Paul says, beware. Some groups teach that unless you spend a certain amount of time witnessing door to door, you're following, you're falling from faith and, and the truth. Beware. Beware of those who put Christians under the bondage of works. Then Paul says, beware of the false circumcision. In other words, beware of those who are promoting their own holiness. And three examples come to mind. Years ago, when I was pastor of the uh, neighborhood church in Santa Cruz, California, and by the way, these people I'm talking about are dead. So they're not going to know what I'm saying, okay? We had one dear lady there who claimed to live above sin and said she was fully sanctified. Now, it's true. In Scripture, we are declared holy and sanctified in Christ, okay? But that's not what she meant. She meant that she was living above sin. And one day after the uh, Sunday evening service, there was a group of us talking, and suddenly she looked at her watch, and she says, Oh, I've got to run. And she says, I've got to go home and watch And then she mentioned a TV program that I thought one who was fully sanctified shouldn't watch. And then uh, Carolyn and I were at a a, a gathering. I won't go into more detail than that. And we were introduced to a lady who was probably in her 20s. And in our conversation, she claimed to be uh, living above sin. And uh, that's one of the goals of Adventism. And uh, I said, really? I said... uh, Paul didn't claim that. He claimed to be one of the chief of sinners. And I asked her, I said, have you bypassed Paul in righteousness? And without a moment's hesitation, she said, yes. (laughs) Later, we found out that she was living with a man who was not her husband. And some time ago, I was watching somebody being interviewed, and they were asked, do you ever have to ask for forgiveness? And he said, no, I don't have to ask for forgiveness. All right, we need to beware of those who put on a front of their own righteousness. Beware of those who proselytize believing Christians with the counterfeit gospel. Beware of false teachers who put you back under the bondage of works to earn your salvation. Beware of those who promote their own righteousness instead of the righteousness that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 3. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Now, what Paul is doing now, he has just given us three descriptions of the Judaizers, the false teachers. Now he's going to give us three descriptions of true believers, okay? And he says, number one, We trust the faith of Abraham. That's basically what he's saying. Now, Abraham was accounted righteous years before he received the covenant of circumcision. In Genesis 15, we have the story where God took Abraham out one night and said, Abraham, look at the stars. And he says, can you count them? And I don't know if Abraham tried or not. But it says that God said, this is the way your descendants are going to be, like the stars. And the record says that Abraham believed God, and God counted that belief as righteousness. It was kind of a judicial declaration. So what Paul is saying, that we must trust the faith of Abraham, not the sign of of the covenant that he gave to the Jews. And the faith of Abraham, and this could be applied um, in, in New Testament ways, but I won't have time to do that. The faith of Abraham is believing what God has declared. And if you read through the New Testament and find every declaration God has made about the believing Christian and you believe it whether you think it's true or not in you, that's the faith of Abraham. Abraham didn't have any kids when he said, I believe that. So you may not have any righteousness, but if you believe that God has forgiven you, you believe it anyway. Okay, we trust in the faith of Abraham and not the physical sign. Next, we worship God in the spirit, not in rigid form. As Jesus said to the woman of Samaria, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. 
In other words, true spiritual worship is not necessarily following a rigid list of prescribed duties, but true worship springs from a grateful heart for what Christ has done for us at the cross, like, like we just sang here a few minutes ago. And, and when, sometimes when we sing these songs about what Christ has done for us, uh, I get so choked up I can't even sing. Um, you might say, oh, that's good, because <laughs> I have a good voice for cooling soup. Now, the third characteristic of true believers is they put no confidence in the flesh. As I said, I was a very legalistic Seventh-day Adventist, and I tried hard to keep the laws of Adventism. And I had a long list of sins and things that I had not done. However, when I was on what I thought was my deathbed, I was terrified to die. I had no assurance of salvation. Even though I could say, I haven't done that, I haven't done that, I haven't done that, I recognized I was not good enough. And in order to bring some kind of hope to my troubled soul, I started repeating verses of Scripture that I had memorized uh, years ago. And I came to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Suddenly, for the first time in my life, I understood what this verse said and meant. And again, I had memorized it before, but it never hit home to my soul as it did that day when I was facing death. Suddenly, I realized that all I had to do was confess, simply admit that I was a sinner. And God did the forgiving, and this was new insight, did the cleansing. I thought I had to cleanse my own life, but He does the cleansing. Yes, praise God. And I thought I was going to die, and, and suddenly when I realized that God had forgiven me and was cleansing me, I was no longer afraid to die. I could commune with God as I had never done before. I had total peace. And yet, I, I wanted to live. Uh, I had Carolyn, my beloved Carolyn, okay, and I had two little boys, and I said, Lord, I want to live to support them. And I said, I'm going to consider that I died. And every day, I'm going to look at a new day as a gift from you. And I made some promises. I said, I'll do anything you want me to do if you make it clear. And I told God, I said, I'm not very good at discerning God's will, so you're going to have to really make it clear. And then I said, I'll even go back to college and study theology and become a pastor if you want me to. And I did not want to go back to college, and I did not want to become a pastor. Well, in just a few days, I was well. But no confidence in the flesh. True believers put no confidence in their own works. And you can't even put confidence in all the sins you didn't do because you didn't do it well enough. Now Paul goes in verses 4 through 6 to the foolishness of trusting in your own righteousness. He says, although myself, I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, that would be the Judaizers, I far more, and then he lists all these things, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to the zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Now, in order to understand these verses, we must see what Paul is doing. The Judaizers who dogged his steps were basing their confidence in the way that they had kept all the laws of Moses. And so what Paul is going to do, he's going to say, well, if you guys think you have confidence because of your personal behavior and personal heritage, I have far more. And then I'm going to show you that even if you have as much as I have, trusting in that is theological garbage. That's what he's going to say, okay? So that's what Paul is doing here. Okay, he starts with personal heritage that he had nothing to do with. 
circumcised the eighth day. Well, that's exactly as the law required. He was not a Johnny come lately and joined Judaism as a proselyte in late life, but he was born a Jew. And his parents followed the law to the letter, circumcised the eighth day. And then he says, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, he could trace his ancestry back to one of the two existent tribes. And he, Paul's Hebrew name was Saul. He was named after the first king of Israel. So he had a wonderful heritage in Judaism. Now Paul moves to the second credential, which is his personal performance. As to the law of Pharisee, in fact, in Acts 23, we learn that Paul was not only a Pharisee, he was the son of a Pharisee. Now, who were the Pharisees? They were strict law keepers. They knew the 613 laws in the Torah, and they did their best to keep them. That's who the Pharisees were. And Paul says, I was a good Pharisee, to the zeal of persecutor of the church. Well, the Judaizers had a lot of zeal. They would follow Paul around and try to win over his converts. Paul says, I can do better than that. I tried to destroy the church. But he saved his most important thing for the last. As to the righteousness that is in the law, found blameless. Wow. Who could match that? Now, Paul has shown by his own criteria of personal zeal and personal heritage that he has trumped the Judaizers. He's better than them. And now what he does, he says in verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. You know, it's amazing what Paul is doing here. He takes his own record, a stellar performance, and say, I count all that as loss for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. Before Paul met Christ, he must have said to himself, my Jewish heritage and personal performance are a real plus before God. God knows that I'm a true Jew and a son of Abraham, and therefore I deserve his blessings. He knows my self-discipline. He knows I was a straight-A student in the school of Gamaliel and graduated summa cum laude. Yes, Paul thought he was pretty good. And yet when he met God on the Damascus Road, a realignment took place. He says, whatever things were gained to me, I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And have counted is in the perfect tense, which means it was a once-for-all decision. He said, I've carefully considered all my heritage, all my performance, my perfect law-keeping, and I count all that as loss for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And now in verse 8, he expands his commitment. He says, more than that, I count all all things as lost, not just to his heritage and his performance, but everything. Everything, he says, I count in loss as loss. Now, it's interesting that the first time he used a perfect tense, which says that I have counted once and for all. He's made a definite decision. And the next time in verse 8, he uses the present continuous tense. Let me illustrate what Paul is doing. Now, in our uh, race for president, or whoever is going to be nominated, um, have you heard any of the candidates make promises? Anybody? Uh, have you heard anybody say that they walked them back, their promises? Well, you haven't, I have. Quite a few of them say, well, that, maybe I won't do that now because of this and that and the other thing. And they, they go back on their word, not Paul. He says, I considered this carefully, and I counted once and for all, all that is loss. And then he says, I still continue to count that. There was no walking back with Paul. He had determined once and for all that Christ was the ultimate thing in his life. And everything he said was 
like rubbish. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about the meaning of the Greek word translated rubbish. Some think it means nothing but a pile of manure. It can also mean rotten hay. And uh, we have a large lawn, and we planted clover in our orchard. And I thought the mower clippings would make good compost. So I took several old pallets that we had and put them together in a square, wired them together, and started putting all the clippings of the clover and the lawn in there, and pretty soon it started cooking. I have a very diminished, diminished sense of smell, okay? Uh, my wife has a very keen sense of smell. And I kept doing this, and one day she says, Dale, you've got to do something about your compost pile. It stinks. Well, you guessed it. I did nothing. And I uh, kept putting more stuff in. And, and then one day, uh, our neighbor crossed the back fence. I was out in the backyard, and he came over, Dale, I need to talk to you. And he says, I don't know what you've got going on over there, but we have company, and the smell is unbearable. <laughs> well, I wrote her till it in, by the way. And by the way, he came to church today, first time in a long, long time. So not, not at this service, the first service. Um, so what's the point? Paul says, all those good things I count as rubbish, just like a stinking compost pile that disturbs neighbors. Now, before we leave verse 8, I want you to notice carefully the wording. In value of the surpass, or in view, I should say, of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And the way this is written in Greek implies a personal knowledge. Not just an intellectual knowledge, dis, you know, discerned by facts but a personal knowledge, an experience, a conclusion reached intellectually, but also by experience, by knowing, by fellowship, by communion, by relationship, by trust. So I ask you this morning, do you really know Christ as your Lord? Is your experience and relationship with Jesus Christ of sufficient value that you could say it surpasses all things and everything else is like a stinking compost pile. And then verse 9, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now, as Carolyn and I were transitioning out of Adventism, Discovering new facets of the gospel, this verse carried enormous weight for us. We were taught that saving righteousness, and I put this in quotes, was our perfect obedience to the law. And we did our best to be righteous. And yet here Paul clearly states that he did not want to be found having his own righteousness derived from the law even though it was found blameless. So what does he mean? So what is saving righteousness? And this verse tells it all. It's going to tell you what saving righteousness is, why of saving righteousness, where of saving righteousness, how of saving righteousness, and when of saving righteousness. This is the key verse. First of all, what is righteousness? It is a judicial righteousness. And the Greek word used here is the same word for justification. We are righteous by the declaration of God. Just as Abraham was counted as righteous because he believed, we're righteous because God has declared it so. Now, why is saving righteousness judicial or declared righteousness? It's a good question, because it is the very righteousness of God, as Paul states in Romans 3.21. It is the righteousness of God, and it is a much higher righteousness than the righteousness of the law. For example, Jesus said in Matthew 5.20 the following, I say to you, 
that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, when I was an Adventist, I would read this, and it took all assurance away from me. I said, no, wait a minute. The Pharisees were the most meticulous law keepers. And unless my righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, I won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why saving righteousness is judicial righteousness. It's declared righteousness. It's the righteousness of God much higher than the righteousness of the law. So that's the what and the why. Where is saving righteousness? It is found only in Christ. And here is the problem with the cults. They move saving righteousness in Christ alone to a set of laws and behaviors that you must follow if you want the assurance of God. And if you trust in your own obedience... You never know when your obedience is good enough, number one. And number two, your obedience never is good enough. But it's, we, it's very clear teaching in the New Testament that we all fall short of the glory of God. Even Paul said, I'm a chief of sinners, okay. In ourselves, and Luther said it, same time sinner, same time righteous. In ourselves, we're not perfect. In Christ, we are perfect. All right? So how do we get this saving righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith? By faith in Christ. And faith has two legs. It is belief and it is trust. We believe the facts of the gospel and we trust our lives to Jesus Christ. That's saving faith. And When do we get this saving faith, this judicial faith, this righteousness of God that is in Christ by faith? When we hear the simple yet profound gospel that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised the third day for our justification. And when we hear these facts of the gospel, the Holy Spirit is present to give us saving faith. Right now, you can with Paul experience the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as your Lord. You can be declared righteous at this very time. All you have to do is cry out to God like Bill and I cried out for water. And you say, save me, God. I know I'm a sinner and my righteousness is just like a stinking compost pile. I trust in the righteousness that is in Christ Jesus And he will save you right now. That's the word of faith. Then Paul talks about the future value of knowing Christ as his Lord. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul was so in love with Christ that he wanted to share every experience with Christ in a powerful life, in suffering, in dying, and in the resurrection from the dead. He wanted to be with Christ in good times, in times of persecution and suffering, in life and death. Why? Because Paul knew the surpassing value of knowing Christ as his Lord. Yes, The gospel is good news. It's good news for legalists. It's good news for sinners. It's good news for those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Yes, the gospel is like a pitcher of cold water to a couple of tired and hungry hay haulers, and the promise is for you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you've given us a a righteousness that surpasses that of the law. Lord, may we trust in you, and may we come to have that fellowship, to believe, to know that we're saved, 
and to know the surpassing value of personally knowing you as our Lord and Savior. Thank you in Jesus' name. Greetings and welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I want to thank you for being with us today. Well, we have a very special guest in studio and uh, someone who I'm greatly happy to have here with us, uh, Dale Ratzliff. Dale, great to have you here, brother. Great to be here. Uh, Dale, you are a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist. That's right. And uh, so obviously anyone that's watched our shows, and we have over 500 of them now on the internet, on YouTube, uh, anyone that's watched our shows or pays attention to our Sea Answers TV uh, YouTube channel knows that uh, we get experts on a lot of subjects uh, speaking on things that they specialize in. So I think it's pretty obvious at this point that uh, since you are a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist, that your expertise is in that religion. So what we'd like to know is, I get ready to have you start speaking about this, and also you're a prolific author, uh, you have a, a ministry of your own, website, magazine, we're gonna get into all that. Uh, but uh, before we get into that, I'd just like to mention to our viewers that uh, we have uh, newsletters of our ministry right here, free to anyone that wants to get a copy of, of these magazines or not really magazines but uh, newsletters and uh, if you need any other help we have three websites as you can see on your screen uh, and uh, you're f free to call or email us for any assistance you might need but with that said Dale I'd like you to tell our tell our viewers and this is the main purpose for this a lot of viewers may not know who you are may not know what you've done uh, and all these things and that's the whole purpose of this Please uh, inform us as to All right. who you are. <laughs> I'll do my best. Well, I come from a very strong Adventist family. My grandfather uh, was one of the vice presidents of the General Conference. My grandmother was a denominationally employed evangelistic uh, Bible worker. My uh, grandfather, my, I should say my w grandmother's brother was the vice president of the General Conference. My grandfather was a pastor. My uncle was a pastor. My mother and father uh, both were missionaries in Panama and raised up a little Adventist church in the Panamanian jungle. Um, so we have strong Adventist roots. Um, I was married to Carolyn Mundahl who had a was a fourth generation or fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, it was interesting. We uh, knew each other in the third and fourth grades. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we met again in high school and became boyfriend, girlfriend, got married after one year of college. Uh, I was pastoring in Sedona Christian Fellowship. Uh, one of my members wanted me to give a Bible study to some Adventists. And I said, let them lead at first till we get acquainted with them. They bought out the clear word, Adventist Bible. And it just so happened it was on Daniel 8, 14, which I knew. I'd studied that thoroughly. And I read that clear word Bible, and they had added a whole bunch of Ellen White stuff right in the text in the quotes from an angel in Daniel 8. You know, the angel They talks. just added to the Word of God. They just added to the Word of God. And something rose up in me, uh, Holy Spirit or something. I said, this must stop mm -hmm. because this is an outright lie. I knew... Mm -hmm. I mean, I had studied that subject well, okay, mm -hmm. and I knew that was an outright lie. So I, that, that's when I wrote Cultic Doctrine. Mm -hmm. And I did it in six months, 700 footnotes, and it's, it's an in-depth study of the whole beginnings of the Adventist Church, the shut door, which most Adventists don't know about, and the investigative judgment, and that Ellen White is, is a false prophet. Amen. So that's how come I wrote Cultic Doctrine. And then I... Um, I kept getting emails. Uh, I sold quite a few books, okay. Yeah. 
uh, of people who asked me questions, why I left the Adventist Church and so on. And I finally decided, rather than answering all these emails, I'd write uh, Truth Led Me Out, uh, yes. all my story, which I basically told right, here. Right, right. And then uh, people were, uh, evangelicals were saying, can you give me a little summary of the problems of Adventism? And that's mm -hmm. why I wrote Truth About Adventist Truth. Mm -hmm. And that lists the ten main problems of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you might call them the same, the ten major differences between Adventism and Evangelical Christianity. Mm -hmm. And it's just a summary, it's 88 pages long, easy read, but it's documented well enough so you can do more study uh, mm -hmm. to do it. Now I've got a book here in my hand called Sabbath in Christ. Could you, uh, could you tell the people at home about this book? Sure. Sabbath in Christ is the result of a, a group study that took us seven months uh, in a church that I pastored shortly after I left the SDA church. And it's a thorough study of the topic of the Sabbath, the covenants, and the gospel. And uh, many theologians have endorsed it. It's our number one bestseller. It, we have received thousands of emails and letters from people who have been blessed by that book. It's been revised three times, and it's, uh, I think it's in its fifth printing, and uh, it, it will help you answer uh, all the questions you have regarding the topic of the Sabbath. Well, praise God for that. Okay, now here's a, a very special book. It's a book that you haven't written. No. <laughs> it's called My Cup Overflows by Carolyn Ratzliff. So yeah. what can you tell us here? Well, this is interesting. Um, Carolyn is, has been my girlfriend since the third and fourth grade, okay, in, in, in high school and, and, and so on. And um, she wanted to write her experience of leaving the Adventist church. But she wanted to include a lot about our own personal journey in Adventism. And um, an interesting thing in this book was that when we were having our 50th wedding anniversary, my wife was going through, Carolyn was going through some things that my mother had left after she died. She died in 06. And she found a little um, card there that was a Valentine's card. And it said, it showed a, a blindfolded girl chasing a boy. And it said, even though I can't see you, I can seize you. <laughs> and Carolyn said, why in the world did your mom keep that? She turned it over. And on the back it says, Carolyn Mundahl. She wrote that to me in the third grade <laughs> when I was in the fourth grade. So she picks up there and shares our life together in school and high school and so on. And uh, a lot of people have said that's an easy reading book and they really enjoyed it. It's not an e-book. The rest of them are e-books too on Amazon and, and, mm -hmm. and Barnes and Noble. That had too many pictures in it. So right. all the pictures of our, our journey right. together right. are there. Uh, and speaking of uh, publications and things, uh, You've got a very special publication here called the Proclamation Magazine. Now, this particular one I'm looking at as New Adventist President Sets Course affirms the Adventist gospel. Uh, so, basically, can, what can you tell us about the Proclamation Magazine overall, its history, uh, how, how often do you publish it, circulation, things like that. Uh, and then you had mentioned to me before we started filming that this was a very good issue. So what can it's, you tell it's us? It's a good issue for a couple of things. Uh, did Adventist leaders lie to Walter Martin? See, uh, most evangelicals yes. will say, well, Adventists aren't, aren't cults because of what Walter Martin said. Right, right. They don't know that Adventists d deceived him. Right. Okay. In fact, uh, I, uh, you know, just for my own ministry, I actually, on YouTube, I've done a lot of shows on Seventh-day Adventists in the past, and so I've dealt with a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, uh, and I get that Walter Martin arg argument, and because I've been getting your procl Proclamation Magazine all these years, and when I saw this one, I That's saved a good it, one. Yeah. and I made copies of this, and uh, I use your material here to answer these Seventh-day Adventists about Walter Martin on YouTube. Right. And it's come in very handy because then they're speechless. They have nothing they can say because of the well-documented uh, material you have here. Now, it, for someone watching, can they contact your ministry to get a, a subscription? Or Yes, it's, a, it's sent free to about 30,000 homes wow. four times a year, 32-page, full color. Wow. Uh, it has a fascinating history. I'll yes, give that yes. right now. I got you. Okay, and then you also, uh, with your ministry, have a, a website. 
Can you tell us a little bit about your yeah. website? We have f four websites I'd like to mention. My website is called lifeassuranceministries.com. Lifeassuranceministries.com. We're seeing, that on, we're seeing okay. that on the screen. A uh, second uh, one is lifeassuranceministries.org. Now, okay. my.com deals with the books and, and many different articles, and I even have uh, books they can download on my website. Uh, lifeassuranceministries.org deals with proclamation. Oh, okay. okay. The Proclamation Magazine. Right, the Proclamation. And they can sign up free and get it, okay? Okay. Um, then there's formeradventist.com. Okay. That is a, a former Adventist forum, and that's run by Richard and Colleen Tinker, who are now the, uh, you might say, the president and the editors of Proclamation. Okay. okay. I was, but I'm getting up in years. I wanted to hand it over to somebody who's got more energy and <laughs> a longer life than I have. <laughs> anyway, um, the fourth one is truthorfables.com, mm -hmm. and that is a, a website that was developed by someone else. It is huge. He, he was a former Adventist pastor, mm -hmm. and it has a huge amount of material on Ellen White and Adventist issues. You could spend hours and hours and hours there going through it and searching mm -hmm. it. So uh, our, our, our um, uh, nonprofit corporation owns that now. So uh, it, it's so all those websites are phenomenal research for anybody that wants to know the truth about Seventh Day Adventists. So often when I'm getting emails and phone calls off the the Seventh Day Adventist programs we've already put up on YouTube and on public access TV and everything, uh, the the people are uh, a lot of them are coming out and they want to know more and, and 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 they just have ravenous appetites. You know, I've got a bunch of tracks and things I give them. I give them Xerox copies of some of your stuff and all that. Uh, but uh, these four websites you're mentioning sounds like just the ticket for a lot of these people that want to really dig in and spend a lot of serious study time to really get to the bottom yeah. of this issue. Yeah, Proclamation has been going since 2000. And so there is a wealth of information there. And they can download it, okay? Right, right. Uh, Ministries.org. you can go back and download a full-color one in a PDF file. You mm -hmm. can print out on your printer. Mm -hmm. And so it's all available free. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels with just a quick message to our viewers to check out our main YouTube channel C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, where we have all of our over 610 videos posted. By going there, you can see all of our videos organized by playlist, categorized by subjects. Once you scroll down past our Bible Prophecy trailer at the top of the channel page, the playlist begin. You'll see our recent uploads playlist, followed by our most popular videos playlist, followed by our playlist on Jehovah's Witnesses, then Islam, the Muslim religion, then Roman Catholicism, Darwin's metaphysical evolution religion, Seventh-day Adventism, dealing with anti-Trinitarians and early church history, our multiple playlists, which includes God-hating atheists, phony TV preachers and King James onlyists, dealing with UFOs, ghosts, spiritual warfare, our radio shows with national Christian authors and our music bids, the black Muslims, Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, Mormonism, hell, lake of fire, unpopular Bible doctrines, antichrist, cults, new age and world religions. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, and Spanish videos, end times, supernatural prophecies, and tough Bible questions, and our playlist dealing with predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism. Our YouTube channel is built to help people learn the Bible and defend their Christian faith against false prophets that come against it 
from every side, Jude verses 3 and 4. At the time of this recording, our channel has already been blessed with over 6 million viewings and over 10,000 subscribers.